Hi, and welcome back to the Shane Plays Out of the Abyss Notes series, where I talk about the D&D 5th Edition Underdark Adventure, Out of the Abyss, uh, as I DM my group of intrepid players uh, through this adventure campaign at my friendly local game store. Remember, support your friendly local game store. I can't believe it. I think this is video 60. It blows me away. I, I've actually sat down now, by the time I finish this video, and talked about this venture 60 times, which also means that we've had 60 sessions, I think, with my group, and we're not done yet. Uh, we're, we're over halfway now, uh, maybe even 75% of the way done, but wow, I mean, you know, I, I it's a campaign. When they say campaign, there's a lot going on here, and, and also remember, as I've said before, you know, we play two, two and a half hours a week, um, you know, because we play the game store in the evenings, so... You know, if you're doing four to five hour sessions once a week or more, you know, you'll make it through more swiftly than we have. But as a recap, if, if you're not familiar with this video series, first of all, thanks for watching. But this is not an actual play. Uh, what this is, is I recap each week's session as I DM the adventure. And then I kind of give my notes on how to run it, what I think about that particular part of the adventure, stuff that the players did. Talk about rules, clarifications, and just other D and D and RPG stuff. So, uh, you know, for returning viewers, you know, so glad you're back, and I get a lot of good feedback on this uh, on this video series, which again is why I keep doing it. As long as you know the the viewership stays steady or rises, I'll keep doing it. You know, if it drops significantly, uh, you know, we average a little over 100 viewers once it's been out for a few weeks each video. I'm cool with that because um, prepping them and everything also helps me be a better DM. But if I go lower than that, uh, you know, it does take, by the time I record, edit, prep, but it, it does take some time. So, and I've mentioned that on a couple of videos that I want people to think it's going away. Uh, it's it's not. I just, you know, it's something I want to make sure because the, the levels drop just a little bit on, on average viewership. So I just want to make sure, you know, you know, if you like this series, make sure to watch it or give it a thumbs up or, or something like that. Okay, moving right along. This um, this session was Graven Hollow, uh, the, the Stone Giant Library in the Underdark. And and I have to say that it's, it's one of my favorite chapters so far to run for this adventure. And, you know, I'll get into why here in a little bit. But first, we've got to do viewer feedback. So uh, I'm going to put on my plus three spectacles of viewer feedback and let's see what the electronic mailbag has brought us for episode 59 okay so episode 59 um old man nene said i'm planning to run this adventure thanks for all these videos it is very difficult campaign to manage and the notes have been very helpful and you know thank you old man nene for the feedback again that's one of the reasons why I keep doing it, because uh, I, I hear over and over the that people are like, this is helpful, you know, so I, I don't mind doing it. Uh, and, and you're welcome. Thanks for the feedback. Okay, so let's see. D1 Morto said, I run out of the abyss as well, and we are also taking about a month off. Uh, he's referring to the fact that due to life and work and other stuff, I was almost out a month uh, between running out of the abyss and also, you know, doing videos and, and that sort of thing. So that's that's what he's he or she is referring to. Everyone has things going on near the end of the year due to holidays. It's just tough to schedule things. But it gives me lots of time to prep extra stuff. And he says, love the videos. They're a great resource. Again, thank you, uh, D1 Mordo. I really appreciate that for the feedback. Um, and, you know, plan to keep doing them. And, you know, enjoy your prep. Sometimes prepping and reading and, you know, uh, thinking about what you're going to do can can be as fun for a DM as, as actually playing. So, And I know that for players like, you know, making their characters or reading about their characters or planning what they're going to do with their characters and when they level up or whatever, you know, can, can be just as much fun, if not more so than playing sometimes, the anticipation. Um, let's see. Vasily Crisson said, as always, excellent info. Thank you, Vasily. Uh, by the way, is that computer in the background a Commodore 64 or a Tandy 1000? And let me see if I can get my, this video, or video, this computer is actually a classic original Amiga 2000. Um, and you'll see this TV, 
TV, yeah, the TV down there is because I have some classic video game consoles as well. Uh, I have an Odyssey 2 and an Intellivision. Uh, and, and basically, I'm trying to collect uh, retro technology and kind of build my own little personal museum or, you know, playground or whatever. I also have a, a, an Apple II-E. Uh, the, the Amiga there was a, a gift from a friend of mine named Nathan, uh, who has a lot of uh, older computer equipment, is very generous with it. Um, you know, he's a super nice guy. I also have an Amiga 500 from Nathan. Um, and then I've got, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of collecting all this stuff together. I was, one of my computers, main computers growing up, well, not growing up, like right when I graduated high school, joined the Air Force and everything, I bought an Amiga. And then in high school, a lot of my friends had Commodore 64s and an Amigas and Amigas. And that, and that was a very nostalgic computer for me. And at, at its time, the Amiga was bar none like the most amazing personal computer of its time I, it is you know prefer audio visual capabilities and graphics and sound it was, it was just amazing uh in europe you know it was larger than it was in the united states but kind of comes down to a lot there was like this kind of battle uh between the uh the amiga and the atari st in in uh, the states and i never i never owned or interacted with an atari st that i'm aware of but they were you know kind of competitors uh ibm pc clones didn't come really till later uh although ibm pcs were around uh but yeah the, the good old commodore 64 commodore 128 uh and then you know the amigas now i ever i never actually owned an, an amiga 2000 i owned an amiga 500 uh, and a lot of my friends did as well but i knew people with an amiga 2000s and i'm just tickled pink to have that and that's an original uh, Amiga, I think that's a 1084, if I remember. I, uh, I may be getting a 1084S, which means it has speakers. No, that's not a 1084S. It doesn't have speakers. But anyway, I love that stuff. I, I just love geeking on old technology, and I'm continuing to collect it. So there you go. Probably more information than you wanted to know. Uh, as, as a, as a uh, side story, if you're curious about you know things in the life of Shane when he was growing up, I never owned a Commodore 64, but a lot of my friends did. And I kept asking for a Commodore computer, and I finally got one at Christmas. And uh, I had said over and over, um, you know, my friends were like, what do you want for Christmas? I said, well, I would love a Commodore 64 computer because I wanted to play games. And I like, you know, 10 print, whatever, go to 10. I let, you know, a little bit of print. And I was programming basic. My stepdad had a TI-994A, and I would, I would work on it. Um, but, and I, and I said over and over, you know, I don't want, a computer if I don't get a disk drive because I knew at that point the importance without a disk drive at that point floppy disk drive you really couldn't do it. as soon as you turned it off you lost everything and like no games were coming out at that point on cassette none of the games I wanted to play so a cassette drive well, I was not interested in anyway so I got the computer for Christmas without of course a disk drive so I was like well okay so I was glad to have it couldn't do much with it my friend's Commodore 64 crapped out on him he said can I borrow your Commodore 128 I said sure I, I can't do much with it right now uh and and then his house burnt down and i lost my commodore <laughs> 128 so there you go that's probably more information than you want to know about um about my personal computer history uh and then of course you know i, I own an amiga and then you know eventually got on the once once ibm clones uh you know between the the sound blaster cards and the graphics cards and the video cards you know got caught up you know it's just fine so Never really looked back. Um, did own a Mac mainly because I was curious, wanted to play around with it. I've never, you know, I'm not like a, a, a huge Mac head. Anyway, so there you go, Vasily. That is actually not a Tandy or a Commodore 64. It's an Amiga 2000. So, all right. Okay. Uh, James Swanson wrote in, and it's it's a very good comment, but it's also a long comment, so I'm not going to read the whole thing here. Uh, but he, but he did. He said, "If you don't shoehorn a left-handed bucktooth metrosexual dentist from Miami into your campaign as an NPC, I think all of us will be a little bit disappointed." And he's referring to something I said in the previous video. Uh, you know, I, I guess I'll have to now. So I'll see how I can work that in for you. I mean, if we can have demons from the abyss running around, I don't know why we can't have a left-handed bucktooth metrosexual dentist from Miami uh, in the mix. But um, let's see, let's get to his, uh, comment. 
Okay, so um, he basically, you know, he's, he's, he says that uh, videos have been helpful for his campaign, which is great. Um, always glad to hear that. But the, the, the substance of his comment is my uh, opinion on whether Out of the Abyss, the, the campaign itself, is a railroad kind of campaign on rails uh, as opposed to a sandbox campaign. And um, so if you want, you know, the, want the, the fuller context of what he's asking, you know, go to video 59 and, and find his comment. But, uh, you know, he, uh, so my answer was, I think overall, I, I would say that Out of the Abyss is written like a sandbox campaign, uh, but the, the story progression is linear and really any prepackaged uh, adventure or campaign you buy, how can it not be linear to a certain extent? Because there's a, be a beginning, a middle, end, you know, rising action, climax, falling. I mean, all this stuff, these, these, are, these are, you know, story elements from like the beginning of writing and literature, you know, I mean, otherwise it's not really an adventure. It's not really a campaign. It's, it's just a collection of random encounters or something, you know, or a source book. Um, but anyway, so I said a sandbox campaign, yet the story progression is linear, which, you know, it can cause some headaches uh, and, and consternation and stuff for the DM because really uh, in, in part one of Out of the Abyss, it's more sandboxy than part two. Part two is much more, although the players can go wherever they want, really they need to go from here to here to here to here. They start in um, Gontel Grimm, Say, so, hey, you know, to go to Mantle Dareth, you get to Mantle Dareth, so, like go to Graven Hollow, you leave Graven Hollow, and there's really one next logical place you need to go. So it's very linear. I mean, even though technically the players go, well, you know, I want to go to, I want to go to Blending Stone and check in and see what's going on. I mean, they can. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense in my opinion, but they, but they can if they want to. And, you know, everyone's cool with it. Uh, but anyway, part two is, you know, is more linear. Part one is, is more of a sandbox giving that, uh, you know, the characters are lost and trying to survive and find their way out of the Underdark. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's more sandboxy, the first part. But even then, you know, it could be argued that, uh, you know, if you're sticking to a strict timeline that, you know, Demogorgon's going to raise its slew blue dop at this point, and this is happening there at this point, and that's happening there at that point. So, really, you're just fudging it that no matter how long it takes them to get to slew blue dop, uh, or no matter how long it takes to, to get them to Neverlight Grove or Blending Stone, that that stuff's just waiting on them to get there, no matter how long it takes them. Uh, and, and, and at a certain point, you do need to nudge them. You know, they're like, hey, let's go set up an underground kingdom in the Underdark because it's a sandbox game. We can do whatever we want. So you got to kind of know, well, you know, might want to kind of get to Grackle Stug. You might want to kind of get to Slew Blue Dop. And that's where NPCs and all that come in handy or, or just, you know, if you're a good DM, I don't, I don't care what, what adventure or campaign you're running. If you're a DM, every now and then you're going to have to s gently nudge players in a certain direction if you want to stick to the story you intended to, st to tell. Uh, so from that perspective, all of role playing, all of D&D uh, &D and all that is, is linear to a certain extent. So uh, now I know there's some like, hip new role-playing styles where everything is completely spontaneous and group and player. To, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, you know, D and D and, and the, the traditional role-playing game as we understand it. Um, but anyway, so that's my best answer. I think, I think that, uh, uh, you know, wizards of the coast, uh, D and D five E or whatever, a lot of role-playing game companies and systems are struggling with this, goal to provide a sandbox experience because sandbox is hip see I, I don't have a problem with a linear adventure even a role playing I'm fine with it uh, in fact a lot of the uh, the game both tabletop and computer role playing games they want all this choice and consequent and I want if I do this then all that changes and I want my companions to be beautifully unfolding just tell me a good story good beginning middle and end I don't care if it's you know if I still have to solve problems and you know, develop my characters to the point where I can keep moving forward. I'm fine with that. You know, and even these open-ended computer role-playing games, 
still have a main plot line running through them. You can go off to the side and do all this other stuff if you want, but if, you know, it's written to carry you along on a story path. Um, so my original point, I don't, I don't mind if stuff is kind of on rails. Most entertainment is on rails to a certain extent. Uh, a book is on rails. A movie is on rails. A comic book's on rails. Most board games, card games, it's all on rails to a certain extent. So a lot of the sandbox that people want is, is kind of an illusion. I mean, it's sandboxy to a point, um, but it's not a complete sandbox or you're not really telling a story. I mean, you're telling a story, but you're not... In order to, I think, to have an ultimately satisfying campaign, you know, there, there does need some pre-thought and an outline of what might happen when and some high points and some plot twists and, and all that stuff. So anyway, I, that's a big tangent I didn't mean to get on, off on. But uh, the, the bottom line is I, I think that, you know, D&D, Wizards of the Coast, all these companies, you know, they want to provide a sandbox experience because that's what's hip and that's what everybody wants. Don't restrict me, man. Uh, let, you know, imag store, you know, imagination's king and all that, uh, you know, but th they're struggling with the reality that, you know, pre-written adventures almost need to be linear to an extent. So, you know, it's a sandbox. Well, no, it's not really. It just has a lot of sandboxy stuff you can do in it, but the main story is not sandboxy, you know, what one of my cats just sneezed. So anyway. Uh, that's the best I can answer that. First half of Out of the Abyss is more sandboxy than the second half. However, there is a story plot line you're following that by definition is somewhat linear. So there we go. Clear as mud. Um, okay, I appreciate your question there, James. Now, uh, Rob Plummer, um, good to hear from you again, Rob, said uh, he said he has to cancel every other week as of late. So he understands my being out for a while. Again, the reference to me having like basically a month out of the loop running the game and doing the videos on it. Uh, he said it, he, he will say that his players are ever more into his sessions when everybody returns. And some joke that on our group night, they might show up on my front porch step and roll some dice for their fix. And I said, well, they're literal murder hobos. And, uh, and Rob Plummer said, old school all the way. So I'm down with you, Rob. I'll give you a little fist bump there. All right. Uh, the Michael Metcalf uh, said, I've actually started rewatching some of your older videos, mainly the ones in Grackle Stug, uh, because my party's there right now. As you have said in the past, it's a monster of a city. It really is. Uh, you're right. You could honestly run the city as its own separate adventure. And yeah, straight up. And then he also said, thanks for recommending the Cobalt Fight Club, which is a encounter calculator that I talked about last video. Uh, and he said, but you forgot the first rule. Yeah, I, I talked about Cobalt Fight Club. So Cobalt Tyler Durden is sending someone to cut off my um, nether regions right now. So if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. And I also said, Gracklestug indeed has many moving parts and is about as structured as Jell-O. Um, there was some help docs I linked in the videos in the past, I don't even know which numbers they are off the top of my head, that, that help run Gracklestug, and I would definitely recommend to the Michael Metcalf or anybody else, if you're running Gracklestug, go find those videos, go use those links, because they help me tremendously. It's kind of like flowcharts and stuff, and the list of NPCs and all the factions and stuff, because Gracklestug is crazy. It really could run it as its own um, separate adventure, and it's, it's a bit unorganized. I think that's one of the weaker... It's good content, uh, but a very weak, organized part of the adventure as written. Um, you got to do a lot of extra work, in my opinion, to, to make that, make Grackle Stug work uh, so that it's it's not a complete um, unorganized mess to you or your players. Okay, and finally, um, Vicky Stegan, I hope I'm saying that right, Vicky, uh, said, hey, Shane, happy to have you back. Hey, Vicky, I'm glad to be back. Uh, she said, I was wondering if you could give me some feedback and some advice. We're running out of the abyss, and my PCs just returned to Blending Stone after finishing it up in Mantle Dareth. Now, there's an example of nonlinear, um, sand, more of a sandbox thing. Like with Mantle Dareth, really, the most, you know, most people are going to go, okay, we're done with Mantle Dareth. Let's go to um, uh, 
Graven Hollow. Because you went to Mantle Dareth to get the ring with the little compass gem to take you to Graven Hollow. Well, your whole point is to get to Graven Hollow. The only reason you even went to Mantle Dareth was to find out how to get to Graven Hollow. But in this case, Vicky's group went to Blendingstone. That's fine. Um, now, eventually, if they keep playing the game as written, they're going to have to, you know, get back on the track to Graven Hollow or whatever. But, but whatever. Okay. So, uh, and she says, one of my PCs was refusing to do anything anyone in the city or in the party would tell him to do, uh, and even threatening to kill some of the guards. Well, speaking of murder, murder hobos, this caused the people of the city to start to despise him for his actions, strangely enough. Um, this, and then, um, eventually it got to a boiling point where Dorbo Diggermatok, if you remember Dorbo and his wife, or something, Sor not Sorbo, I can't remember, I'd have to go look it up. They run Blending Stone, basically. Uh, Dorbo Diggermatok took action and exiled his player from the city, threatening to have the guards kill him if he was ever caught back inside the city. This player is not normally so aggressive, but was sort of different this time. So, wonder why the player is acting different, but sometimes you can't deal with the motive inside, you just have to deal with the behavior. Um... This player is not normally so aggressive, but it's sort of different this time. Any ideas on how to handle this situation? The PCs plan on returning to the city uh, where they want to leave him outside, but he wants to sneak inside the city. Should I have the guards kill him if he's caught? Or should I have them lock him up to give him a chance to fix things up? Thanks again for everything. Okay. So let that simmer for a minute. You know, players acting crazy. Uh, the, the character is acting crazy, not listening to the NPCs that are important, not listening to the party, evidently. Uh, threatened to kill guards inside Blending Stone and has been kicked out of Blending Stone and said, if I catch you back in, I'll have my guards kill you. And now the player is stating they plan to sneak back into the city. So, I said, in general, I never go out of my way to get characters or players. Um, but at the same time, I won't protect them from their own actions and if you've been keeping up with this video series you'll know that like i may i may you know have a little bit of leniency here and there or give them a, ch a second chance or something but sooner or later i'll let the hammer fall um so uh so i, I, I won't go out of my way to get a character at the same time i won't protect them from their own actions especially if they have had more than one chance uh in this specific instance vicky's instance I think it is 100% fair to allow the, gu the guards to attempt to kill him if he's caught inside the city again. Dorbo has already been merciful to some extent. Dorbo, you know, Dorbo could have just had him killed. You're causing problems. You're threatening to kill my guards. You know, we are got craziness going on. In there. I'm not going to deal with you. Um, could have had him killed. And I think that I'd have to go look up the, the Spurth Neblum alignment but I, I don't think it would be out of the question especially if you're threatening to kill guards and stuff like that but especially now said so i've kicked you out if i catch you back in my city i've ordered my guards to kill you and the guy comes back in anyway um i think it's totally fine to allow you know the guards to attempt to kill him not an automatic kill but you know give him a chance have a bunch of guards attack him uh but then i also said this player is also frankly being a jerk to the rest of the players for disrupting the flow of the game. Um, so I don't, I don't think that it's really out of the question uh, to, if it gets way out of hand, uh, remove that player from the group. But before I would do that, um, because Vicky said something kind of key, the player doesn't usually act like this. So if it really gets out of hand, I mean, it might be worth just right. Everything will, you know, it's, it's something going on in their life or at the table or something that has helped trigger this change. I'm not saying that excuses the behavior, but it may, you know, cast a different light on it, on how to, how to address it. So I'm not saying that as a DM, we have to be counselors and psych, you know, psychologists and all the psychiatrists and all that. But, you know, it's kind of my philosophy in life. If somebody does something really rude or something, but it's, and it's really out of character for them, or they start acting rude and that's not in character for them, 
before you just, you know, get out, I hate you, or I'm going to fire you from this job, or whatever, try to find out, is something going on? Because a lot of times, like, people are having troubles at home or, or something. Now, I'm not saying that's the case here. I'm just saying, you know, if it's really out of the blue, what is going on here? And it's, just, you know, then it, it doesn't hurt to, especially if you're friends with a player or whatever, uh, to try to find out, you know, what's going on. So that's viewer feedback for this uh, video. And uh, now we'll get on to what happened in Graven Hollow. And like I said, I think Graven Hollow is a really fun um, part of Out of the Abyss. So moving forward. So at the end of last video, um, they had just defeated um, Hermastocles the All-Crushing in, um, in that, that sort of weird terrain feature that I kind of invented for the Underdark. Uh, which you're free to use. Um, maybe I'll post it again here, uh, a picture of it here, but it's in the previous video where I described it. it. said they make, nobody knows where they come from, but they're kind of desirable in the, um, in the Underdark as, as outposts. So we talked about outposts with the players, and they, you know, and in the intervening, in between sessions, I sent them the information from Out of the Abyss uh, in Chapter 10 on creating outposts. Now, we covered more of Chapter 10 last week. Um, you know, all of the stuff that was not expedition management because we had covered, you know, expedition management several videos back. Everything that, that's not related to expedition management that's in Chapter 10, we basically covered last video. So if you're curious about traveling in the Underdark, outpost, random encounters, the state of various areas, the Underdark, et cetera, in Part 2, go check out last video. Um, anyway, so that, you know, uh, one of the things that we had to talk about and that I had posed them as a question in between sessions on our private Facebook group was, are you going to man this outpost? Because if you create an outpost and man it, then uh, you've got to leave some NPCs behind. I mean, I guess you could leave a player behind, but that'd be kind of uncool. So really, you need to leave uh, some NPCs behind. Now, the expedition is it, when I first discovered and read about this whole expedition of 20 plus something NPCs, I was like, oh, I don't want to run this. But the more I mess with it, the more I enjoy it. Uh, we've had some cool role playing with it. Uh, we did a little bit more expedition management this past uh, session. Um, and, and also, again, go to Elven Tower. I can't stress it enough. Elven Tower's resources on running out of the abyss are excellent on how to handle the expedition NPCs and how to manage everything. Uh, so combine that with the notes from Chapter 10 uh, and Out of the Abyss with Elven Tower's notes and you'll be fine. But if you really don't like the expedition, uh, you know, you can whittle them down by having uh, NPCs get killed by encounters. Another thing you can do is, is have the um, players set up outposts as they're working through the Underdark and they can leave you know, three or four NPCs behind each time. And soon, you know, over time, that'll take care of all these NPCs running around. So um, that's definitely, you know, one of the ways uh, that, that, that you can handle that. But again, let me let me stress that I, I've really come to enjoy um, the expedition part of... So all that being said, I didn't actually see anywhere in the book that said here's how many people you need to ha leave behind for an outpost there's actually in chapter 10 there is a uh, a new downtime activity you know like the other like, downtime activities in the player's handbook or whatever i think there's some in the dungeon master's guide you know crafting or uh you know uh, uh working a trade i think i think you can be like a you know a carouser there's all these different downtime activities that people can do and you know it's just assumed when you're not actively actively adventuring or whatever during your downtime, you're you're doing this other thing, and building outposts is one of them um, that's been added in in chapter ten of, of Out of the Abyss. So I didn't see guidance anywhere. Maybe I missed it uh, on how many people to leave behind. So I just kind of th I thought, well, uh, you know, uh, you get people have to be able to. Um, rest somebody has to be on watch you need somebody to you know cover your back 
while you're resting or on watch or you know people have got to be foraging maybe for food even though you'll leave some supplies so i just said three or four people uh and i and you know i'm kind of looking at it as like a wartime footing because they're kind of in a wartime footing with what's going on in the underdark and they're on a mission from their various factions uh you know king bruin are kind of yeah, we're in big trouble we got to figure out what's going on here so yeah you're you're not going to be taking a day off or anything like that you're just going to be running a constant sleep watch forage manning this outpost so i figured three or four people was enough to just keep that going because you're not going to be well it's your day off tomorrow i mean you that's what you're going to do perpetually until this is all resolved or until you're dead um which you know with what's going on in the underdark is equally likely for some poor fool sitting in an outpost um and another thing I did, and I think I mentioned that I might do this last video, but uh, I, I, I can't remember if I did, but I definitely did it, was I introduced, now that we're setting up Outpost, I introduced uh, Sending Stones, which are basically magical stones that will uh, do the sending spell, where you can send a short, uh, I think it's like 12 words or less, something like that. You can't do, you know, they're not like cell phones. You can sit there and have just all these conversations. But you can send short messages, um, very brief, clear, concise messages with these sending stones. And Eldith said, okay, now that we're away from Mantle Dareth and it's not politically sensitive to the Zentarum, because we've left Mantle Dareth, we're not on their secret path and all this and that and the other. And she busted out this little chest that had sending stones in it. So now the party has sending stones. Each outpost is going to get a sending stone, and there's sending stones back at Gontalgrim. So now at this part, now that we're finished with Mantle Dareth, and, and there was all this secrecy with the Zentarum of taking the Mantle Dareth, and this and that and the other, um, now it's okay to introduce sending stones. And that's just something I did. I would encourage you to do that. It just saw, you know, how do you communicate with Gontalgrim? What if the, what if somebody a player dies or a player character dies? You need to replace. How do you even communicate that we need a replacement character? Uh, you know, because narratively we have some other guild members of the guild, the Vanguard of the Eye that the players belong to are hanging out outside of Gontalgrim in case they're needed. So how do you, how do you do you communicate all that? So I introduced these Sending Stones, uh, which I actually think kind of sh should have been part of the adventure. Um, if, and I've, I've said, I've had read other blogs and whatever on out of the abyss that mentioned you know there should be some teleport a teleporting helmet or something like that uh because none of my players are high enough to throw a teleport you know we're even i think everybody's seventh level and they're not even high enough to throw greater restoration yet which is really needed you know they're a little bit behind the power curve level wise but they've got a large party and they've been handling everything just fine so i'm leaving them at the level they've that they've legitimately earned. I'm not just bumping them a, a level to bump them a level. Uh, so anyway, sending stones. So now you can all the outposts and the Gontel Grim people, Bruiner, whoever, and the party, the expedition can all do short messages to each other. I just thought that was a smart thing to do. Again, I would encourage you to do that. They, you know, they did a lot of thinking like who do we leave behind like because you know we we've done enough of this expedition stuff that you know they understand the political consequences and even who can i trust like which faction can i trust uh and they ultimately settled on the zentarum which is which was interesting to me um but that's that's what they went they left four zentarum behind and there's eight zentarum thugs so they left four behind, which still leaves them four Zentarum thugs, which I thought was pretty smart. Uh, and then they, um, like the lead thug, uh, they, they developed a uh, relationship with uh, that's, I think, Goreth Torn. And they went to him and said, hey, can, you know, can we prevail upon you to help man this outpost? And so they got his buy-in and Goreth was like, okay. So he picked out four of the Zentarum to, and, and then just absolutely chewed them out before he put them in the, uh, the outpost, basically the big foxhole, you know, he's like, you're not going to mess this up. This is serious. You will not abandon this outpost. You will not take this lightly. You will stay here until you are relieved. You know, remember we're on orders from the black network itself, which is, you know, he really chewed them out. 
and they're like, okay. So, you know, making the point that, and I did that role playing wise so that the players could know that, you know, you could probably trust this, right? Because I don't want to go, well, we left the guitar on, what's going to happen, blah, 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 blah. Because I'm playing it like every faction that has representatives in this mission, they all have their own vested interest in the success of the mission. And the outpost is part of the success of the mission. And whether the individual people in the expedition care or not, their superiors are like, you're going to go on this expedition. And so they're, you know, even if they don't respect the party members, which the Zentarum are the ones that were probably most likely to not, like, wait, who are you? We don't care. Um, you know, the, the, they still respect the wishes and the orders of their superiors. So there we go with that. Now, uh, so they left for... Um, of them behind, you know, they got a long rest in. I, I, I said there's so many people there. I think it takes like 150 man hour or 150 character hours or whatever to build an outpost. So there's so many NPCs there. You're just, you'll, you'll knock it out. Don't worry about it. So we basically did a long rest. Um, and they moved on and left for the Vizantara behind. And I had already determined in my mind that it was going to, that they were really close to Graven Hollow. Like I wanted to go ahead and get them there. Now that we, uh, now that we had the exercise of last session playing around and having fun with what traveling in the Underdark is like in part two of the out of the abyss, had some fun combat, introduced the concept of outpost. Uh, and one thing I want to, you know, like last video, I was like, well, I don't know how far is it between mantle Dareth and Graven Hollow. And I went and calculated it by the map. And it was, uh, by, you know, by the time I calculated it, I said it was like 57 days travel. And I think they said, uh, 60 days in, in the book. There's, a uh, if you look in chapter one or page 151 in chapter 11, Graven Hollow. Yeah. It says the journey from Mantle Dareth to Graven Hollow takes 60 days. So I, hey, I did all right. Um, cause I said 57 days, uh, if the characters teleport back to Gontol Grimm, and start there, it takes 20 days. But in my part, anyway, teleporting is not an option. Uh, again, I've, I've seen some blogs recommend at certain places. They even mention, you know, in this treasure loot, leave a helmet of teleportation or something. But but I, ironically, I guess, if you look at the map, what happens is when you leave Mantle Dareth, you go back west uh, and you backtrack to northeast of Gontelgrim when you leave Mantle Dareth. So you do all that overland, all that crazy stuff to get to Mantle Dareth, and then you go to Graven Hollow, and you actually, in some ways, almost go back to Gontelgrim. Uh, but you're a little northeast of Gontelgrim. Uh, you know, so there, there you go. Um, now, um, it says that there are... Uh, okay, so I'll give you a little bit more information here for chapter 11 graven hollow it says the objective of the adventures return to the underdark is to find graven hollow that's what i'm saying if you don't go to graven hollow after mantle dareth i mean that's fine but you really graven hollow is a major destination you need to get there eventually uh ancient ancient legends state that every event that has ever occurred in the underdark is recorded on the countless tablets and cylinders in graven hollow's halls as such it might be the key to discovering the cause of the demon lord's arrival and it in fact is uh, the Stone Library lies west of the Worm Writhings, 360 miles from Mantle Dareth and 120 miles from Gontelgrim. Only one tunnel leads to the library, and the magic surrounding Graven Hollow can change where the tunnel's entrance appears among the surrounding passageways, even as that magic allows visitors to locate its entrance. Fortunately for the characters, the library's awareness, in tune with all events in the Underdark, knows that they are coming. As such, the ring obtained from Zintarum, from the Zintarum, Gazrum Duloc, in Mantle Dareth, refer to chapter 9 for more, allows them to find the secret site. That's basically saying if Graven Hollow didn't want to be found, even though they had the magic ring that has like a little compass built into it that will show you the shortest and safest, not the shortest, but the shortest and safest route to Graven Hollow, it wouldn't work if Graven Hollow didn't want you to find it. So I kind of... It, it mentions several times uh, in, in this chapter that, you know, the library will help characters in certain instances or maybe not help them in others. I kind of played the, the, the Graven Hollow, which is the Stone Giants library. So it records 
all the stuff in the Underdark, and it also records all the history and stuff in present and future of the Stone Giants. So if it relates to Stone Giants, or if it relates to the Underdark, it's in this library. It is not an all-comprehensive of everything of the surface world. The Stone Giants think of the surface world as a dream. Uh, but if it's Stone Giants or Underdark, it is in this library. And then I took and kind of added a little bit of the personality and intelligence of the TARDIS from Doctor Who uh, to Graven Hollow. So it, 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 it helped in some cases maybe more than the book intended the characters. But in other cases, it maybe didn't. It kind of said, I don't want you to do that. Uh, which is what the TARDIS does. The TARDIS will get you where you need to go, uh, but it may not get you where you want to go. Uh, it's kind of, if you're not familiar with Doctor Who, his, his time space machine that looks like a blue police call box from, you know, 60s Britain is actually, a, a, it has like this cantankerous personality that loves him or, or her, the new doctor is going to be Jodie Whittaker. Uh, and so I kind of played around and, and added a little bit to the personality and, and the behavior of the library. So, um, but anyway, there's three ways to find this library. Uh, if you don't, if for whatever reason they didn't get Gazrum Duloc's ring uh, in Mantle Dareth, uh, then the, if they if they have any of the uh, Society of Brilliance, which is some NPCs that's a random encounter in part one of uh, Out of the Abyss, they, um, they, they can lead characters there because they found it before. Uh, any Society of Brilliance member who comes within a day's travel of the library can make a DC-15 intelligence check, try to find it, et cetera, et cetera. And then if, 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 if they have a stone giant guide and they, if they don't have the Society of Brilliance with them, or somebody from the Society of Brilliance, if they don't have Gazrum's ring, Gazrum's ring, um, then if, if they could possibly go talk to, um, like a Duergar NPC, which could be Golder Flagonfist and Mantle Dareth, but a Duergar NPC might suggest they, because the Duergar are from Gracklestug, and Stone Speaker Hagram is in, um, um, no, I guess the Stone. This says Stone Speaker Hagram speak to him in Gontelgrim. That's page fifty-one, but I think they meant Gracklestug, because that's where Stone Keeper Hagram and the other Stone Giants. There's Stone Giants. There's an enclave of Stone Giants inside Gracklestug, which is the Grey Dwarf uh, city in the Underdark. I mean, I guess it's possible that uh, was it Chapter Eight or Chapter Seven when you went back into the Underdark. And hooked up with King Bruiner and met all the faction members. And it's possible this maybe that uh, that Stone Speaker Hagram was in Gondolgrim. I don't remember that, but anyway, uh, Stone Speaker Hagram will assign um, if 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 the characters helped the Stone Giants by putting an end uh, to the the Darrow rituals and the Whirlstone Tunnels, which is in Chapter Four in Gracklestug. Uh, which my party did, then then Stone Speaker Hagram will assign them a, a stone giant named Jal who can lead them there. So um, anyway, so those are the three ways that you can get to Graven Hollow. And remember, unless you just completely go off the rails, we're talking about sandbox rails a lot in this video, and rewrite how this adventure goes, they got to get to Graven Hollow to, to move the plot forward. So regardless of how they actually get to Graven Hollow, once they get within a day, um, there's a really interesting encounter with an intelligent basilisk named Veldiskar. And uh, they, um, they, within their day's travel, they hear uh, singing in, in various languages. And eventually they get to sort of a crossroads in the tunnels. And uh, there's a, they meet Veldiskar, the basilisk. And he's just sitting there and he's, and he's singing. And he has his eyes pointed to the ground. Because this is an intelligent, sort of awakened basilisk that is a, a guide and a protector for Graven Hollow. And if he's been kind of taught, you know, don't don't turn all of our visitors to stone. You know, if they're expected, guide them to Graven Hollow. And he also knows how to cast greater restoration once per day. In case he was taught that because he was a little aggressive in his early days of being sort of a guardian and he would turn people to stone and he's like, Oh no. So the stone giants, 
uh, in Gra Graven Hollow have taught him how to do um, uh, greater restoration once per day. Which so if you have somebody with permanent madness or some other condition that um, is for whatever reason the party can't take, handle it. Like my party right now does not have greater restoration. They're, the, the cleric is not high enough level to cast it, and they don't have access to scrolls, spells, or potions, or or scrolls or anything. So I actually had a thing where uh, I've got two players: one who daydreams on occasion because he's got indefinite madness, uh, but the daydreams are so vivid they think they're reality. Uh, and then another one that just goes catatonic at certain times, and this is both a res as a result of that that black gem in mantle dareth that had a demon lord in it so another character just kind of goes catatonic so on the journey it takes about another eight hours after you meet this uh awakened uh basilisk and and somewhere along the journey um you know the, the guy went catatonic and you know it it, it came out that oh he's, he's got madness and and velvet scar cured it for him uh or her the players a players a guy the characters of ladies have cured her uh, and then the other person with uh, madness is like, why can't I get healed? You know, and it's like, well, the Veldiscar didn't know. And he, you know, Veldiscar is funny. I'm sorry. I can only do it every so often. And he's like, well, can you heal me later? And so we kind of like, well, if you run into Veldiscar again and he doesn't need it at the moment, and can he, then he will. And so that's, that's kind of where it, but point is, if, if, if you need greater restoration and, and your party hasn't gotten access to it yet, Veldiscar can help. Um, so when they get to the gates, now one thing I messed up on is I assumed that the, the library, due to its nature, that the entire expeditionary force would not be allowed in. So the, the basilisk was like, no, just, just those that have been called, uh, and by that I meant basically the main player characters, can come into the library. And I made this big elaborate role-playing thing out of it. Uh, only to only to find out that on page 151, um, it says that uh, the gates of Graven Hollow, the doors can be opened simply by pushing, after which the entire expeditionary force can enter along with the characters. Oops. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, but narratively, I didn't really want the whole expedition in there. Uh, but I mean, I guess when you leave Graven Hollow, it kind of makes sense because when you leave Graven Hollow, it will magically put you in the right tunnel to continue on wherever your next destination is. So I'm just going to alter it so that when they leave, they're in the right tunnel and a, a somewhat confused expeditionary force is right there. Like, Whoa. so I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it that way. Um, so anyway, Graven Hollow itself is, is a great, um, chapter i love it uh it is um like it says walking across this is on page 151 it says walking across the threshold of graven hollow is like stepping into another realm the oppressive gloom of the underdark is replaced by light and a sense of openness that brings back memories of a surface world and so i i kind of explain i said this isn't exactly like it but it's like you you walk in you haven't been to grandma's house for a long time and you walk in and she's cooking bread and, or you smell something that smells just like your grandmother cooking bread. And you just immediately feel that warmth and comfort of being a grandma's house that just peace. Uh, and, and it, and it just, you know, something akin to that. Uh, but the point is Graven hollow is a place of peace and warmth. There's no gloominess. It is, its own physical area in the underdark that has its own rules of physics and time um, and space and that's another reason it's kind of like its own little tardis it's bigger on the inside all that um and it's it's no matter the madness of the underdark is not in graven hollow now i i don't think that the uh, the the designers the writers of this adventure intend graven hollow to be used as Let's evacuate everybody in the Underdark and the entire world into Graven Hollow. You know, maybe some DM or party will want to do it that way, in which case you'll have to cross that bridge when you come to it story-wise. But it's it's untouched. Now, my feeling is, is if you have the Demon Lords, all the Demon Lords of the, of the Abyss rampaging around the Prime Material Plane, eventually Graven Hollow would fall as well, eventually. So it's kind of like... Um, 
from the Lord of the Rings, like Tom Bombadil's little area that he lived in would be protected from a long time if, if, if Sauron won the war because Tom Bombadil on his home, if you don't know Tom Bombadil, actually go read Fellowship of the Ring and there's a whole section in there on Tom Bombadil that was left out of the movies. Uh, and he would actually, but he, even he would fall. Uh, even his area would fall. Uh, although it would take a long time and, and, and whatnot. So that's kind of how I see Graven Hollow with the madness and the demon lords and all that. If the demon lords are left unchecked, then forget it. The whole planet or whatever that um, the Forgotten Realms are on or whatever setting you're running this game in are gone eventually. Uh, it's just all hosed. So um, anyway, so you go into Graven Hollow. Some really cool stuff happens. I'm going to try to summarize because I, I could probably talk for hours about Graven Hollow. It's really cool. I really liked it a lot. Now, one thing I want to be very clear that Graven Hollow is not. Again, I have stressed this. It, it there there is a there are three librarians. And they're all stone giants. One records the past, one records the present, and another one records the future. And each room in Graven Hollow, uh, and there's there's inscriptions over each door. It's a recurring theme. There's three different inscriptions. One that represents the past. One that represents the present. One represents the future. And it will tell you by reading that, you'll know if you go in there, these, these archives relate to which time period. Another thing, uh, the, the um, once you go into Graven Hollow, it's, it's like everybody can speak everybody's language. There's, it's like everybody is under the comprehend language of spell. Um, even though, uh, yeah, it, it, like the archives of the past on page 154, it says every room devoted to the records of the past has the same inscription carved above the doorway in runes that anyone that knows Dwarvish or Giant understands. But it also says earlier that um, that it's like Comprehend Languages is cast. Uh, yeah, it says thanks to the library's Comprehend Languages effect, anyone can easily decipher and understand the runes and glyphs carved into the stone. So I don't even know why they said that about anyone who knows Dwarvish or Giant understands. I don't know, maybe it was, you know, meant to be corrected later. Maybe they changed how the library worked and, and then in a revision it was left in. I don't know. Maybe the comprehend languages effect could stop. But, oh, I can still read this because I can read Dwarvish or Giant. I don't know. Anyway, so, uh, and as an example, the the verbiage or whatever for Archives of the Past is the past is a crystal. For it can be seen from many facets, yet it always remains the same. And... The present and the future also has its own little poetry or whatever, and it's the same one on all of them. Now, the uh, Graven Hollow itself is kind of built around a central well, a big open well, and each, and there's multiple layers going way up and way down of all of these levels, and there's like crosswalks and stuff crisscrossing the well, and it's just really neat, and there's stairways that go down and go up, and you can never quite figure out how high it goes up or how deep it goes. Uh, you know, you might, one day you might look down and say, oh, it only goes that deep. And then you might look the next day and it looks like it goes even deeper. Or you can never quite figure out how big Graven Hollow is. Kind of like the TARDIS. So, um, so anyway, that, uh, that's, a, that's a feature of Graven Hollow. Um, there's a... There's a sidebar on page 155 that talks about general features of Graven Hollow that I would I would recommend that you read. Read the whole chapter. I mean, I'm not giving you everything. Um, but yeah, definitely read the whole chapter. But it talks about how to, if you want to find anything in Graven Hollow, it's an effort of will. Uh, whenever a character seeks a specific location in the library, a particular floor or period of history, for example, the character must make a successful DC-14 wisdom check to find that location. On a failure... The character takes a wrong turn and must make additional checks until successful. If led by one of the library's keepers, characters don't need to make checks to find the location they seek. Uh, it says, great, hidden from magic, Graven Hollow is a window into the passage of time and history, and the magic permeating the library blocks it off from the real world around it. That's kind of what I was talking about a while ago. Though divination magic works normally within the library, no divination effect used outside the library can discern any creature, object, or location within it. 
So those are just a few features. It's also a place of peace. No fighting is allowed in Graven Hollow. So on the off chance that you meet an actual another physical NPC or character or what or not character but NPC or whatever, and you'll understand what I mean by that, like an actual physical one, a maintain peace or you will be run out. Um, it says creatures that incite conflict quickly draw the attention of the basilisk Veldiskar, or Veldiskar is quick to use his petrifying gaze. If a threat arises that Veldiskar can handle, the library generates 3d6 Gallop Dur to assist him. So the thing when you first arrive at the library, you know the basilisk is like, "Here's the library, have fun," and a Gallop Dur kind of pops out of the wall, shows them around, shows them the rooms. Uh, you know, kind of gives them the general rules of the library and then says, you know, uh, seek out the librarians if you want to know more. Uh, and, and some stuff that can always be found in the library, the library will actually assist you in getting there, is A, if you're looking for a librarian, there's three librarians, again, one for the future, one for the past, and one for the present. They're all stone giants, two males and a female. And uh, if, you're, if you're looking for one of them, you'll find them. If you're looking for your guest quarters, the library will get you there. No matter where you're at or how crazy lost you think you are, the library will get you to your guest quarters or to a librarian. Um, and your guest, the guest quarters are neat because the first time, you know, the, when they first get there, the the Galabdur, Remember, the Galabdur is kind of like a, kind of like an earth elemental. It is an earth elemental, but it's a specific kind. It's not just this big rocky crazy. I mean, it's 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 got its own form and function, uh, and you know, it it leads. It, it, uh, it leads them to their guest quarters. It says, pick whatever you want. And the first time they walk into their guest quarters and say, well, I'll take this or whatever. It's just this bare room. But when they, the next time they leave and the next time they come back in at any point after that, it's perfectly appointed exactly to their taste and desires and what they would normally want. So that's kind of a neat feature uh, that I got to have some fun with. So uh, the librarians, I'll just give you a quick overview the keeper of the past uh, is is uh, polite. He's the most willing and likely to spend time with the library's guests. That's Ulthar, uh, but he treats surface dwellers as if they're figments out of dreams, and uh, but he makes it obvious that dreams have wisdom to share. So he's kind of like whatever. Uh, Ermus, the keeper of the present, is the busiest of all lab- all the librarians. Uh, and he's also actively exchanging messages with stone speaker Hagram, um, keeping abreast of events. Now, um, you know, that in the Duogar community and, and outside, because they, they also, uh, the librarians also track stuff, not just the stone giants, but the, the gray dwarves. Everything in the Underdark, anything to do with the gray dwarves or anything to do with the librarians or the uh, stone giants, they'll track. Uh, and, and this giant seems really in, distracted because he's getting all this news uh, about what's going on in the Underdark and it's freaking him out. But if, if he realizes that the player characters have any news of the, of the adventure, you know, the, the madness and the, and the demon Lords, man, they've totally got his full attention and he will record everything and, and, and pump film for all the information he can get. Now, Astova, the keeper of the future, uh, she's a seer who spends most of her time in constant meditation, transcribing her visions on a stone tablet. She, she experiences them. Uh, she focuses her efforts on the fate of different giant communities and clans, sorting through the various threads of destiny and possibility for omens presaging the resurgence of the giants. One great, once great civilization. Um, the, the interruption of demon Lords in the Underdark has sent powerful ripples of indescribable chaos through her visions. All she sees in the future is fire, blood, death shot through with signs and portents based upon the natures of the demon Lords. Uh, the bloody spirals and twin fort symbols of Demogorgon, the excessive growth and rot of Zuktmoy, etc., etc. She gladly helps any characters who can offer clarity in what she's seeing, treating such information as beneficial visions from the dream that is the world outside the Underdark. So, um, and then um, it, it, they can, the librarians can summon the Galabdur, those elementals whenever they want and and i i don't know if, if the basilisk can on his own but the library will summon him on his behalf if, if he's having trouble so the other thing that um that uh this library is interesting for uh are echoes 
they're not figments they're echoes really of visitors that uh, have have either been to the library or are in the library or will be in the library in the future and to when you interact with them that echo might actually perceive you as an echo because they're in their time they're there and they may see you or your players or whatever as an echo so it's kind of a neat little thing and some of the echoes will barely interact some of them um will be quite talkative and in fact try to pump characters for information some characters some some echoes will be secretive on their own about revealing their own things uh, and it's really kind of interesting they all have their own personality and there is a random encounter table of which echo that you may get and of course you could add your own these echoes are um they're a prime op opportunity according to page 153 uh, to introduce great NPCs of Faerun in a way that will not negatively impact the story you want to tell, nor steal the spotlight from the characters. Now, the first thing that you're thinking is, oh, Dridzd Dorden. Well, no, Dridzd isn't one of the Echoes, but you could make him one if you wanted. That's fine. Um, and then, uh, in fact, the only time Dridzd is mentioned in this adventure that I know of is there's a random encounter earlier in, like, part one where, like, it's like a beholder or... Like a crazy beholder. Somehow you get access to a beholder's kind of fuzzy, fuzzy memories. And it remembers seeing a dual-wielding dark elf ranger that had a Black Panther thing with it. So that's the closest you're going to get to Dritz in this adventure. But you could introduce him here as an Echo. And that would be kind of fun. But you get uh, uh, you get Bruiner Battlehammer. You get a version of Bruiner. Uh, you get the Society of Brilliance. Um, you get... Um, an actual, I think, a demon lord. Uh, yeah, there's that Grast, the demon lord, I think, is in there. Elminster, Illustrial Silverhand, and Darren Zareth. There, there's a lot. Uh, there's a, um, I think there's a Mind Flayer. Yeah, uh, who's trying to save his dying elder brain called Cyrog. There's some neat stuff in the Echoes. And again, it. Uh, it says an echo is a quasi real duplicate of the original creature, except it has one hit point and can attack or cast spells. An echo reduced to zero hit points vanishes. You don't kill the actual person. You just get rid of the echo. Um, and again, you don't know, uh, is this echo from the past, from the present, from the future, uh, or relative, you know, to them, you may be from the past. Uh, in fact, the Elminster is one of the more interesting, um, uh, echoes to encounter because this um, Elminster is from the future and will actually uh, can give a little bit of information if the, if the and my players didn't do this um, but even though I said you know it looks like Elminster is about to press on but he's still pausing for a moment because I was kind of you know giving him a chance to ask more questions of the echo um, but he can give the information that the demonic incursion was the unintended result of a spell cast by Gromf Banray, a former archmage of Menzo Baranzen, which is one of the main pieces of information that you're supposed to gather from Gra Graven Hollow. So one of the echoes can actually give a major piece of information. Um, and if he's, uh, yeah, and he's, he's also, he doesn't reveal like what happened to Gromf and he doesn't want to give too much information about the future. Because, you know, Elminster, I guess, realizes the Echo who encounters him is from the past and is somehow involved in all this, I guess, maybe. Um, it says the characters do press Elminster's Echo for details. It says only if the many great heroes were lost to the demonic tide, um, but several powerful demon lords were driven back to the abyss. So, little hint to how this, but not necessarily the heroes being lost, but to how things are supposed to play out. So... There's some interesting echoes in here. You can introduce your own. Um, there's a lot of information in here about how to access the records, uh, whether they're past, present, or future. I'm not going to go into all that here. Um, and there's also uh, a um, stone speaker crystals. I definitely want to, um, to talk about that. 
Uh, and also on page 156, it does say, approaching librarians, if the characters set out to find a librarian, Ulthar is the one they find first. Uh, so read that little section talking about which um, librarian you'll find first and how the three librarians interact to each other. Uh, now, if your party doesn't have a stone speaker crystal, which if if they did certain things in Gracklestug with the stone giants, stone speaker Hagram should have given them one. And in fact, uh, my party got one. I think you were supposed to save the two headed stone giant at the beginning. I can't remember the party didn't do exactly what the book mentioned, but since they tried to help and they were respectful with the stone giants, the uh, uh, stone sp the stone speaker gave them the stone speaker crystal, which can be used in uh, Graven Hollow for very interesting things. Not the least of which is getting visions, and these visions can help uh, with obtaining the information that the characters need to know about the adventures so they can move forward. But the stone speaker crystals do a lot more than that. Now, if they don't have one, then uh, then uh, Ulthar, um, which he is the hold on a second, he's the keeper of the past, will give them a stone speaker crystal. Um, but he says, and, and, and he tells them how to attune it, you know, how to attune to it. But he says, uh, don't let, don't get lost in the visions they will experience. There's not a real chance of that, but I think that's just the way that, you know, you're going to have visions. You're going to have strong visions if you use these crystals. So, um, you know, and, and in fact you can now I'm going to go to, I'm going to read get into a little bit of the magic item properties of stone speaker crystal, because it's actually a quite powerful magic item. And my players had one never bothered much with it. And in fact, one of the players, I, one of the players that died, uh, or at least their, their fate is a mystery. I think it's the player that when they were in never like Grove, you know, uh, tried to trick, uh, <laughs> Zucked Moy into getting into a, a war with Demogorgon by running in and saying Demogorgon sends his regards and like shooting flame at, at Zuktmoy. And, and so that, I think it was that character. Anyway, one of the characters was carrying some loot from out of the abyss and either died or disappeared or something, or their fate is unknown. And they had the stone speaker crystal. And so the party didn't have one and they never really messed around with it. But, I want to talk about what they can do. Uh, and they can do stuff specific to the library, but in general, as a cool magic item, they can do quite a bit. So I, I recommend that you go study back up on these stone speaker crystals if you haven't already. So there are, this is on page 223 of Out of the Abyss. They're a wondrous item. They're rare and they require attunement. Created by the stone giant librarians of Graven Hollow. This 19-inch long shard of quartz grants you advantage on intelligence investigation, check, investigation checks while it is on your person. So right there, if you're a rogue or something, but you need, you need this. Um, the crystal has 10 charges. While holding it, you can use an action to expend some of its charges to cast one of the following spells from it. Speak with animals. That's two charges. Speak with dead. That's four charges or speak with plants. That's three charges. You could, you know, you could cast all three of those once a day and still have, let's see, five. Uh, you'd have one charge left because it has 10 charges. Um, let's see. When you cast a divination spell, you can use the crystal in place of one material component that would normally be consumed by the spell at a cost of one charge per level of the spell. So if you're casting like a fifth level divination spell, you didn't have the right components or you didn't want to waste your components. You could use this crystal instead and expend five charges because it's a fifth level divination spell. The crystal is not consumed when used this way. Nice. Uh, the crystal regains 1d6 plus four expended charges. So you're going to get at least five back daily at dawn. If you expend the crystal's last charge, roll a d20 on a one. The crystal vanishes lost forever. There you go. Uh, so 
in and of itself, the stone speaker crystal is really cool. And I didn't even really realize that till this chapter. I went and took a second look at it. And because I knew when they got it, in I think chapter four at Gracklestug, it had mentioned that they can be helpful at Graven Hollow. And that's about all, all it really mentioned. And I didn't go look it up. But look at it, I'm like, no, this is a really impressive magical object, magical device or whatever, magic item. Um, but in the library, it has additional functions. Um, it says a creature attuned to a sp stone speaker crystal gains the following additional benefits while in the library. While standing in the archives of the past, with crystal in hand, the creature can choose to experience a vision of the past. After receiving this vision, the creature can experience another vision of the past until it finishes a long rest. And it's basically the same thing on repeat for archives of the present and archives of the future. So, uh, like, basically for each long rest, you can get one vision of the past, one... Uh, vision of uh, the present of something happening at that moment and one um uh the one vision of the future which we, we receive a glimpse of what might happen if the demon lords aren't stopped that's basically what you can get from the future uh and again remember all this stuff the visions this and that and the other in my opinion based on how graven hollow works really has to be related to the underdark to the the gray dwarves or uh, the stone giants even though it doesn't explicitly say that um but like everything else in Graven Hollow is focused on that. Uh, now, this is very uh, useful. While standing in the appropriate archive, the creature can spend two of the crystal's charges to ask a question pertaining to the past, present, or future and receive a truthful answer in the form of a vision. So that, you don't, it's not just once per long rest. You, you can spend charges to do that. Uh, possible visions... I recommend that uh, you look at page 157 and 158 and 159 for that. What I did was um, they 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 asked a very smart question. They went into uh, I think a uh, archive of the past, and they said, um, you know, how did this happen? How did the demon lords get in? Um, and how where is all this madness coming from? And then they spent two charges and, and all that. Now, I had determined that if they did from the past or the present and were trying to get those answers, that, that they would get these answers. But they, the past is the better place to go because it happened in the past. And there is a vision that talks about how a the Gromf Banray, who is a the Archmage of Menzo Baranzen, um, it, it was casting a spell. Everything went horribly wrong. And it basically let the demon lords in. But this was all really he was tricked by Lolf because Lolf wanted to bring the, the demon lords in. So he has this vision and it's all crazy. And then what's supposed to happen is they have to keep like trying to have visions and whatnot. I had the library help. This is where I had the library help because I really wanted them to see. There's also a vision on page 159 of Lolf with like thousands of spider eggs. Um, thousands and thousands of gray eggs. And so I'm like, you, you know, you finish your vision of Gromf Ban Ray and, and, you know, everything went horribly wrong with his summoning spell. And he's like trying to put it in, you know, trying to get back control and he didn't. And things went horribly wrong, fares rest and all this stuff, that magical energy throughout the Underdark. Uh, and so that's, that's how they got in. Something went horribly wrong with some spell he was doing. But really, Loth was behind it. So I had the library... I said, as soon as that vision's over, all of a sudden, uh, you know, you feel uh, the the crystal expending two more charges and you have another vision. And, and I, the, I had the library do that on their behalf because the library's like, you need to see this. And uh, so then they have the vision about Loth. And then Loth realizes she's being scried and it's like, ah, and starts going after the character. And uh, but the library's defenses kick in and. You know, he's protecting the vision ends and he's like, uh, now if, if you see the vision of Loth, you have to do a DC 16 wisdom save or you get one level of madness. Remember there's a, there's still a madness, uh, mechanism in out of the abyss. It hasn't gone away. Uh, you know, it's detailed much more in part one, but certain things and go back to, I think it's, it's either chapter one or chapter two. I think it's chapter two where it goes into this madness system in the underdark 
in Out of the Abyss, which is, which is unique to Out of the Abyss, even though there's madness as a uh, a thing in the Dungeon Master's Guide, this is you can actually get madness and accumulate levels of madness. And as you accumulate madness, it gets worse and, and you have to have it cured or whatever. And it's kind of like the sanity system in Call of Cthulhu. Not exactly, but kind of. Like you keep developing madness from all this craziness and demon lords and just ridiculous stuff happening. It's really horrible, awful, icky stuff happening in the Underdark. Um, and, and the character that had the vision actually failed and got a level of madness. So since we've come back into the Underdark, and I have it, you know, I have everybody's name, level, class, AC, uh, race, sex, uh, you know, whatever, uh, passive perception, all that. I also have a, a little madness column. And, you know, in the first part, we had people developing indefinite madnesses. They were getting enough levels of madness. So you little check there. So one of the characters now has, um, they got a short madness, but what happens is even if the, the first level of madness is a short term, uh, and then it, and it keeps climbing up the scale. So even if the short term madness fades, because it was only supposed to last so long, you get, uh, you still have one check, and it keeps adding. So the next time you get a madness, you're in a madness level two, and and then three. So even though the madness effects may disappear because it's not indefinite, you still have that level of madness tracking on your character until you you know get like greater restoration or something. So the other thing you need to know, uh, and you play, have as much fun as you want with the library. I had characters all over the place, you know, trying to find maps and this and researching this and da 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 da. And, and, and the cleric was trying to research clerical spells and this and that. And, uh, you know, we had, we had some fun with it. Uh, now, with the cleric, and this was just straight up, I just threw it out there. Um, the, uh, the library, basically, because the uh, the, you know, the, the cleric was researching and said, oh, well, you know, I, I see spells here and, and this and that. But remember, clerics are divine spells. So just because you find a scroll or something like that doesn't mean you suddenly learn the spell because it's granted by the deity or whatever that, that's powering the cleric. But what the library did give, because the library is trying to help, um, was because I think they rolled a natural. They were they were doing their wisdom or intelligence check or whatever uh, to try to find stuff in the library. And they rolled a 20, which uh, 20s don't technically apply as a critical success on a skill or an ability or whatever, but I do it that way on a, on, as a house rule. And uh, I, I had the, the, the library gave them, um, gave her a scroll of greater restoration. So she has one scroll of greater restoration because they really need it with all the madness and stuff going around. You know, they still have one character that has, still has indefinite madness these daydreams. Um, which I'll probably have Beldiscar cure that if he brings it up again next session because they haven't quite left the library yet. Um, yeah, you have to do a DC 14 wisdom check to find what you want. Uh, and, and she rolled like a 20. And so I just gave her, I just thought it was a neat thing to give her a, that scroll. So that was fun. Um, let's see if I'm forgetting anything else. Um, I think... Yeah, I think that was all my notes. Uh, the the other major, major thing that happens in this chapter, and I'm sorry I've been long-winded on this video, but Graven Hollow has a lot of stuff going on on it, and I want you to have fun with it. I haven't even talked about everything that's in Graven Hollow. So have fun with it, research it, and you'll really like it. Um, the other thing is there's an, a very important NPC who's actually in the library. He's not an Echo, um, and his name is Viseron. And the, and the characters should encounter him at least once, but I, you know, prob they'll probably encounter him and then encounter him again because, uh, you know, he's a drow uh, and he has a death slide as a servant, but he's, you know, he's, he's in Graven Hollow. It's neutral territory. There's no, you know, conflict allowed. But he also, you know, once they get to talking with him, he's like, you know, I'm against Lolf. I'm against all this stuff and I'm trying to find out what's going on with um, with the madness and everything. So they talk a little bit and then before they leave Graven Hollow, what I had happen was, the, you know, the, uh, the bard was doing the stone spirit, had the second vision and, you know, got a level of madness on that vision, vision of Lolf coming at him before the, the, uh, the library interceded and defended him and 
I think I even rolled it. It was totally appropriate uh, where he, he, he basically came under a fear effect where he was running as far as he could each round to get away, just run. So he's like, eh, and goes running out. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the, the characters are kind of following him to try to try to catch up to him, which we just eventually they're going to catch up to him and the, ma- and the fear is going to wear off and all that. There's no other, you know, hostile entities to get him in, or whatever in the library. But they bump into this this uh, this guy again, Viseran. And he's like, oh, okay, I'm judging by that that you now know what's going on. And he goes, I actually already knew, but I wanted you to find out for yourself so you would believe it. Um, and he's like, you know, because I knew that's why you were here. The library wouldn't want you here unless, you know, it wa- you know it, it was going to help you. And da, da, da. So he basically said he has this um, uh, uh, spiel that he gives where it says that fool Gronk brought the demon lords down upon us with his demon queen pulling his strings all the way or all the while he has given Loth free free reign in the abyss my own research leads me to believe Gromp used fair's rest to achieve such a summoning though i'm sure he didn't attend this result imbecile and remember Gromp is like the archmage of menzo baranza and he's no lightweight by any means but he was manipulated by Loth. um I can save you months of research, time we clearly don't have. The information I found here has confirmed my theories, and I know how to banish the demon lords back to the abyss. We can do this only if we work together. If you are willing and daring enough to directly challenge the demon lords, or perhaps foolhardy is the better word. So that's where we ended. Uh, But that's basically Graven Hollow done. You find out that Gromph, Banray, who is a very... Power, you know, the ban rays are very powerful house in, in Menzo Bronzen and, you know, he's like the archmage and all this stuff. That's like the highest you can go as a male drow is to be the archmage because, you know, it's it's a matriarchal society under Loth, not a patriarchal society. So men, male drow are second class. Uh, so to be the archmage, you got to be, you got to have your stuff together. But yet, you know, he was still manipulated. So, but this guy's calling him an imbecile. So that's the hook to lead into the next chapter where, you know, he's going to, Viseran is going to say, come to my tower and we'll plan and, and work all this out, uh, which we'll pick up on next, next video. Uh, you know, my players mentioned that they still had a couple of things they wanted to do in the library. I'll allow it to a certain extent, but if they just, you know, really want to camp out in the library, you know, eventually they're going to get hints from the librarians in the library that, you know, you, kind of learn what you can learn you kind of need to move on and then when they leave the library they again they will magically be in the perfect tunnel to get them where they need to go or at least on the first leg of their journey and the expedition is just going to be there kind of confused so uh that is graven hollow uh and if you're curious my players want to uh one of my players who's crazy about maps uh and kept failing wisdom saving throws wants to get good maps of the underdark and i think i'm gonna allow that to a certain extent uh because he's you know he's always role played from the very beginning of the campaign that he's taking the best maps he can of the underdark um and he's even gotten in trouble with npcs for mapping when he shouldn't be like specifically with the zentarum when they were going to mantle dareth and going to the secret ways and all that stuff and he was also trying to map uh how to get to graven hollow and the uh um uh, the Basilisk, Veldiscar was like, please don't do that. So anyway, and then there was some other stuff they mentioned that I can't remember off the top of my head. So I'll let them play around a little bit, but I want to move them on. Graven Hollow is a very cool chapter. It's, it's a good expedition, exposition, not expedition, well, expedition could be there, but it's an exposition. It's a info dump on more of the plot. Uh, what happened? What do we need to do next? And it's just a fun chapter with different stuff that can happen. Um, and it's very, you know, very important, again, to uh, give that one moment of, oh, we can breathe, we're in the dark, but we're at peace for a moment. And it's really nice to be in here, but now we got to go back out into the madness. So anyway, uh, welcome your comments. Please leave this video a, a thumbs up and a comment uh, if you can on at least a thumbs up on YouTube. That helps me out a lot. It really does. YouTube really likes to see those interactions. And, uh, you know, leave me your comments. I love to get your feedback. And we will definitely check you next time on Chain Plays. And I apologize again for the length of this video. But there's just a lot of stuff I want to talk about. I really had fun with this chapter. So I hope you do as well. And we will catch you next time on Chain Plays.